I'm your host, Aaron Heath. I'd like to take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 65 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 065. Well, for this episode, we got a carry tip again, and we actually seem to be getting a pretty good response to these. So we're going to, I'm actually going to sit down and I'm going to pull a bunch of these old ones back up and come up with some new ones. And we're going to, well, they're going to be a regular feature. However, before we go to our carry tip, I'm going to let you know that I'm recording this episode 181 days, four hours, nine minutes, and no seconds. That's the time right now, or it was about five seconds ago. But that's the time that I'm recording this episode for release. Now, for the record, that would be July 3rd. This episode will release on July 5th, which means it'll be 179 days until open carry is legal. Now, how about that? We got a countdown right there on the front page of the website, and you can see exactly how long it'll be until it actually is legal. We got it down to the hours, and you may notice that it actually shows four hours when there's only, like, well, it's not exactly four hours until midnight. It's more like three hours until midnight. Well, and I'm just using four and three as a, as a reference because that's what's up there right now as I'm recording this, but the reason is there's, we do have a time change in there and that other hour is accounting for that. Just FYI, this clock is accurate to the hour. And depending on the clock on the server or the clock on your computer, I don't know which one it actually goes by. It could be as accurate as the second, but we are accurate within an hour. And more or less within a minute or so, depending on the clock that is actually being pulled for the time. I'm not sure what this timer uses, but I think it uses the timer on the computer, on the server, not your computer. However, let's get back to our carry tip. And our carry tip is wear a gun belt. Now, a good gun belt is critical to carrying a handgun. And a good gun belt will pass as a dress belt. It will serve for a number of other reasons. However, it is stiffer, thicker, and it's going to make sure your gun doesn't move around and flop on you. And you really don't want your gun flopping around, especially if you're open carrying in a holster that may not have retention. And for those of you who don't know, retention is not required under our law that was passed. You have to be taught about retention if you take a class. You know what? I do need to touch on that, too. The DPS has released some information, but we're going to, before I go back to that, let me continue our carry tip. The reason you want to wear a good gun belt is because it secures your weapon. It keeps it in the same place where when you go to draw, your weapon's going to be there. A good gun belt is also extra, extra thick. And the reason it's extra thick, where most belts are made with a single layer of leather, a good gun belt has two layers of leather and possibly even a layer of Kydex or some other material to make it more rigid. And the reason you want that is the more rigid the belt is, the better it behaves with a weight on it. Different manufacturers have different ways of actually going about, I'm trying to think of the best way to put this. They have different ways of measuring what size belt you need. And because of that, you have to, you have to make sure you measure the belt the way that the manufacturer that you are looking at ordering from measures the belt. Once you know that you're golden, but Hey, that's enough rambling and carrying on about a carry tip. Let me run the audio clip that tells you how to get the podcast. And after that, I'll come back and we'll talk about, uh, well, we'll talk about what the DPS announced on their website about, well, open carry.
The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Well, the Texas DPS posted to their website the new laws for concealed handgun license, or they title it New Laws for Concealed Handgun License CHL Program. The summary of the new laws passed in the 84th regular legislative session that impact concealed handgun licensing. And right there at the top of the page, open carry, House Bill 910, effective January 1st. And it goes on down the list and tells you what all is uh, required. Or some general information is what it starts off with. I was going to start off with what is required for signage, but that actually comes after the general information. I'm actually looking at this on their website right now. The general information is it authorizes individuals to obtain a license to openly carry a handgun in the same places that allow the license carrying of a concealed handgun with some exceptions. And then it says see exceptions below for more information. And then it has unconcealed handguns loaded or unloaded must be carried in a shoulder or belt holster. And that's an interesting thing to mention because those of you who know the or who have followed this podcast, we have a listener, I forget her last name, but her name is actually the same as a video game character. And she ha- she absolutely hates that. But I've met this young lady. She's uh, she is a very nice person to talk to. And I had an opportunity to talk with her the other day, and she was telling me she was recently having to work in the state of New Mexico. And there's this guy in a Mustang. I forget what color she described it. He had Texas plates, and he had a uh, Molly vest on. And he had some kind of a holster affixed to the vest with the gun pointing up at his chin. And he was pumping gas at the same uh, at the same facility, she was putting gas in her work truck, and she noticed she noticed him because he kept shaking his head no while looking down at the ground. Turns out, the gun was affixed to the Molly vest, with the barrel pointed up at his chin, and rather than reach up and scratch his chin with his finger, he's he's actually manipulating his neck so his chin is on the gun and he's just shaking his head no to scratch his chin on the on the muzzle of his weapon it's people like that and the people that would probably be walking around with the gun in their hand rather than in a holster is the reason we have the requirement for a shoulder or belt holster and in all honesty People like that probably need to be evaluated for mental health or at least to make sure that they know what they're doing with that firearm. I mean, yeah, they're probably carrying in some tactical, uh, and by tactical, I mean tactical manner that they've seen in some TV show or they've read about in some, I would like to be an operator, but I'll just pretend that I am magazine. But there's no good reason to holster a gun where it's actually pointed up at your head. But anyways, back to what the DPS has on their website, because I got sidetracked. Individuals who hold a valid CHL may continue to carry with valid existing license. In other words, you don't have to go get a new license to carry after the first. And then they have... A separate license will not be required to open carry. No additional fee will be required. In other words, one license, any way you want to carry. And then it has individuals currently licensed will not be required to attend additional training. Training curriculum for new applicants will be updated to reflect the new training requirements related to the use of restraint holsters and methods to ensure the secure carrying of openly carried handguns, 
The new curriculum will be required for classes beginning January 1, 2016. That's not bad. Everything looks like the DPS is on the ball here. The eligibility criteria to obtain a license to carry do not change. That should say does not. The department will be updating website forms and training materials to reference license to carry LTC instead of concealed handgun license CHL. That's a big change right there. A Texas LTC. Changes to the laminated license are being developed and will be implemented at a later date. That's not bad. And then we have signage. Private businesses may post signs that, or blah, let me re read that. Private businesses may post signs to indicate entry on the property with a handgun by a license holder is forbidden. Penal Code Section 30.06 provides the language to be included on signs that indicate license holders are forbidden to carry concealed. Penal Code Section 30.07 provides the language to be included on signs to indicate license holders are forbidden to open carry. Posting of both signs is an indication that, biz that license holders are forbidden to carry concealed or openly. Now the exceptions to carrying anywhere that you can carry concealed openly. Open carry is not permitted by a license holder regardless of whether the handgun is holstered on the premises of an institution of higher education or private or independent institution of higher education. That makes sense since that's where campus carry is going to be making changes. But this is where open carry did not make as much progress as concealed carry. On any public or private driveway, street, sidewalk, or, or walkway, parking lot, parking garage, or other parking area of an institution of higher education or private or independent institution of higher education. Okay. Basically, you cannot openly carry a handgun anywhere on the campus of a college or other higher education facility. And here's, here's the final location that's an exception. Or the final exception, it's not a location. An individual who is acting as a personal security officer under Chapter 1702 Occupations Code and is not wearing a uniform. Hmm. Basically, they're keeping things the same way as they were for private security officers. And then they have some things on campus carry. And then they have some various other changes. And we're really not going to cover those because we're already past the, I want to say we're probably past the 10 minute mark. And on that note, I want an audio clip that tells you how to find the show on social media. And when I come back, we'll actually hit our topic. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook. You can follow it on Twitter. You can circle it on Google Plus, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. Well, our topic here will be litigation and political goals and a lot of other things. Now, recently we've had a lot of court rulings that have kind of energized the gun rights movement. And the first one I really want to touch on is the Puerto Rico court ruling on firearms. Now, I don't know the name of the case, but this was actually in the Puerto Rican Commonwealth Court, not a federal court. That means that this ruling has no federal status anywhere. 
However, this ruling said, based on the Second Amendment, Puerto Rico's registry, where everybody that owned any gun had to register every gun, and the requirement of a license in order to carry was unconstitutional. As a result, you had unlicensed carry legalized immediately. Some folks are saying, I don't know how it works there. This is a state issue or actually territorial issue. But, hey, it's progress. And I believe this was the Sisters of the Second Amendment, a affiliate of the Second Amendment Foundation that brought this case. Great case. It doesn't have any federal... Uh, it doesn't have anything in the federal aspect that says, yeah, this will apply to these areas in the same district. But hey, it's progress and it's important progress. That's what that's what really matters. And then we had the health care ruling, which that case is King versus Burwell. Now, the court ruled on their interpretation of the intent of the law. And this means they did not actually adhere to the letter of the law. This is a very dangerous precedent considering the potential for similar rulings in the future. And this is a good case to show why you really want to avoid the court system if possible. You may say, well, that really doesn't apply to guns. It doesn't apply to guns, but it shows how everybody was expecting the court to rule, okay, this is what the law says, this is what you actually have to do. And instead, they went exactly 180 degrees to that, I said, well, this is the intent of what the legislature wanted, and what the law says really doesn't matter. And that's extremely dangerous. That's extremely dangerous because if you take a case to the Supreme Court on gun rights, and you're thinking, okay, they're going to rule that the right to carry is a constitutionally protected right under the Second Amendment, and we're going to get unlicensed carry all 50 states right now, and the court says, well, this is what the Second Amendment says. However, the practice of concealed carry was kind of a bad thing back then. So the intent of our founding fathers wasn't to legalize concealed carry. It was instead to make sure that people could own firearms, not necessarily carry them. So carry isn't protected. They could do that. And then we would have to fight bad precedent to move forward. And that's why this health care ruling needs to be looked at by anyone taking a case to the Supreme Court. It doesn't matter if it's a gun rights case, a health care case, or a, a case on trade secrets for building tricycles for toddlers. I really don't know where I came up with that one. However, that is where the danger of going to the court system can be illustrated very well. A lot of people saying, well, this ruling is kind of like this separate but equal uh, ruling and will eventually be overturned. Don't bet on it. Not in our lifetimes. I mean, in all honesty, in our lifetimes, we may not see this ruling overturned. We may not see any ruling that has been handed down in our lifetime being overturned within our lifetime. That's a very serious risk. And that's why we got to avoid bad case law. And then we have the gay marriage ruling. Now, this particular case was Obergefell versus Hodges, I believe. I hope I didn't mispronounce it too badly. There's a serious problem trying to use this ruling as precedent for litigation on anything gun-related because 
This ruling deals with litigation for protected classes. Gun owners are not considered protected classes by courts in anywhere, nor are they considered protected classes by any of the legislatures in the 50 states or the federal system. And as a result, the courts are not likely to apply this case law to gun owners. Now, the ruling made using, or the ruling made in this case was made using the due process and equal protection clauses of the 14th Amendment. And this can be found in Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, and it says, All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of the law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of laws. Now, some folks are claiming this really means we just got unlicensed nationwide carry. The logic here is that because some states have unlicensed carry, we should all have that right under the due process and equal protection clauses. The danger here, and this is, this is a very serious issue to consider, the danger here is that there is no ruling on gun rights for this issue. You can make any claim you want that the Constitution supports this position or that position. You can make any claim you want to that this particular case law makes uh, this apply here or there. But in the end, it's going to go to the courts. If you, if you really want to find out if your argument's going to hold water, it's going to go to the courts. And when it goes to the courts, it can go either way. And this particular ruling only applies to marriage licenses. This ruling does not apply to concealed handgun licenses or licenses to carries or licenses to carry or to license to own a firearm or any of that. And, you know, when somebody says this means we get nationwide reciprocity if we don't get unlicensed carry nationwide, the problem is, while that claim may be more reasonable than unlicensed carry claims, it's still dangerous. Again, there's no ruling on this issue. Gun owners are not a protected class. Therefore, this ruling will probably not be applied to them. Now, if we really want to go back and force the issue of nationwide reciprocity via litigation, then maybe the full faith and credit clause is a far more applicable and far more useful tool in our constitutional toolbox. Now, I do want to touch on something else, and that something else will be a look back at Open Carry Texas and their 2015 legislative goals and results, as well as promised litigation. Now, in October of 2015, more specifically October 10th, Open Carry Texas posted 13 goals that they had for the 2015 legislative session. Their first goal was repeal laws that infringe on our right to keep and bear arms, colon, constitutional carry. Well, unlicensed carry didn't pass. In fact, I don't even think it uh, had a committee hearing. Their second goal was voluntary CHL, 
with disqualifiers only limited to crimes in which guns were used and violent crimes. This, in part, would have been included in unlicensed carry. I didn't see a bill that offered all of this or offered what wasn't included in their unlicensed carry bill. Oddly enough, it didn't go anywhere. Then they had reduced costs of voluntary CHL to $20. I don't recall seeing any legislation introduced on that issue. And then they had, for their fourth political or their fourth legislative goal, clarifying the disorderly conduct law to protect regular law abiding gun owners. This is something that uh, I know the TSRA supported. I know that Charles Cotton supported it. And I'm 99.99% certain the NRA's uh, legislative representative. Tara Mitchell supported this. And I also know that this was a TSRA issue. As a result, I do have to say this bill did not make it out of committee. It would have been a good bill to get passed. It would have helped a lot start, uh, when open carry starts. But we'll deal with it as we go along. It'll get added to the list for next year, too. Or at least in my case, it will be. Their fifth legislative goal was increase the penalty for making a false 911 call. If someone is shot or killed, as a result, the caller is charged with felony manslaughter. I think that should have been if someone is shot and killed. Because you just shoot somebody and they're wounded, then you can't charge somebody with manslaughter. Now, I don't recall seeing any legislation on that issue. Then they had whole police officers accountable for shooting law-abiding gun owners or violating their right to carry without justification. And that was their sixth legislative goal. Let's keep that one in mind because it's going to kind of, uh, it's going to kind of butt up with another one they have. And I don't recall seeing any legislation on that issue as well. And then we see Open Carry Texas and their dislike of the TABC come into play. Abolish the TABC code sections as they relate to possession of legal firearms on premises of TABC license holders. I didn't see any legislation on that issue either. It may have been part of their unlicensed carry bill. In fact, it would have made sense to put it there. But I haven't thought about that bill since it was pretty much declared DOA. And basically, that legislation went nowhere. Number eight of their legislative goals is kind of an amusing thing for me. State nullification of the Federal Gun-Free School Zone Act that places an unconstitutional thousand-foot bubble around schools. I don't recall seeing any legislation on that issue. And such legislation would have been a pipe dream because, well, federal law supersedes state law. You cannot nullify federal law with a state law. But did you know there's an exception to that federal law? That's right. If you have a license from the state that you're in, you're golden. Also, that unconstitutional thousand-foot bubble around schools that they refer to, I think the Supreme Court in the uh, Keller and McDonald's decisions kind of said, yeah, sensitive locations can be considered off-limits for possession of firearms. 
as a result, well, you're going to find that I don't know of any court in the country that would say that thousand foot bubble would be unconstitutional. As much as I don't like it, I have to admit the courts probably will, probably will defend that. And their ninth polit- or legislative goal, I keep wanting to say political, was strengthen preemption law and make it applicable to state agencies as well as municipalities. Well, TSRA legislation, which in the form of Senate Bill 273, passed. Now, that particular bill provides penalties for posting invalid signage to prevent concealed carry in government buildings. Funny thing is, I thought it was. No, it is Senate Bill 273 because I went back to the DPS website. I got that open in another tab. I went back to that and looked. It is Senate Bill 273. I was going to say I thought it was House Bill 273. But it was Senate Bill 273. Now, the 10th legislative goal was pass campus carry legislation. And I would like to let you know that the TSRA-sponsored legislation passed, although because the legislation got watered down in order to be able to pass it, we do have future work that we have to do. Now, OCT's 11th legislative goal is kind of confusing to me. The 11th legislative goal was lower the age to possess a firearm and obtain a CHL to 18 years old. Hmm. 18 years old. Well. Uh, you realize that you can purchase and possess a firearm at 18 years old in Texas. Thanks to Texas Penal Code Section 46.06. And as far back as I can remember, it has always allowed the purchase of firearms, including handguns, by 18-year-olds. And I think long guns can be possessed by someone as young as 16, although I'd have to go look it up. So don't quote me on that, and before you depend on that, go look that up. However, federal law prohibits federal firearms licensed dealers. These are people that sell new guns as well as used guns that are sold or traded into them. But an FFL dealer is prohibited from selling a handgun to anyone under 21 years of age. This is federal law. You cannot override it with a state law. And federal law has no prohibition on private transfers for any age. Or at least any age that applies in Texas. Now, I agree the CHL should be lowered to 18 years across the board. However, if I remember if I remember correctly, Open Carry Texas posted that if someone's able to join the military and die for their country, they should be able to get a license to carry a handgun or should be able to buy one too. Well, the purchase requirement is A-OK. And the license, if you join the military, you can get a concealed handgun license at 18. That's right, 18 to 21. CHL is perfectly legal for you to apply and receive if you're 18 to 21 and if you're in the military. If you're not in the military, you've got to be at least 21. And then we have number 12. This is where they want to remove exemptions that allow politicians, attorneys, off-duty police officers, and other state employees to legally carry a firearm where other law-abiding citizens cannot. I don't recall seeing any legislation on this issue. And as far as this legislation goes, I'm kind of a mixed opinions on this. I think that politicians, attorneys, off-duty police officers, 
license holders should all carry in the almost exactly the same locations. If there's a location that an on-duty police officer can carry, then an off-duty police officer should be able to carry there as well. Other than that, yeah. I fully support anything that would have been passed on that. Unfortunately, I don't recall seeing any legislation. Now, you remember when I said, keep in mind legislative goal number six for Open Carry Texas? Legislative goal number six was hold police officers accountable for shooting law-abiding gun owners or violating their right to carry without justification. Well, goal number 13 is pass a law that makes the shooting of an unarmed citizen or animal. You see, this here could have been combined with that one as one goal. But it, let me go on, or let me start over on that. Pass a law that makes the shooting of a of an unarmed citizen or animal by a police officer a crime and subject to the same charges any other citizen would face for doing the same. Well, in most cases, it is already like that. But I don't recall seeing any legislation on this issue. And if you hear that in the background... That's not gunshots, that's firecrackers and fireworks and similar noisemakers. It just barely got dark. Or dark enough. However, you know, as far as Open Carry Texas and their legislative goals for the 2015 session goes, I think the only thing that advanced that was on their list were TSRA issues and the fact that, well, they stood out and opposed license carry from the start means that they pretty much had a net loss. But then they had a promise of litigation. And their litigation promise was made on October 18th, 2014, when they posted to Facebook, we're confident with about 98% certainty we're going to have open carry next year. Unfortunately, right now, the odds are that our elected, official, or our elected politicians are going to see dollar signs in that right and try to license it. If we only get licensed open carry next year, open carry Texas will file a lawsuit against the state. Now, I recently tweeted out a public request asking how this litigation is progressing. For my trouble, Open Carry Texas was kind enough to block me on Twitter. Now, after that reasoned discourse with Twitter or with Open Carry Texas on Twitter, I posted a request to their Facebook page, and I was ignored. I wasn't blocked, I wasn't banned, but I was ignored. Go figure. They act so much like a Bloomberg camp. Uh, they act like they're from the Bloomberg camp so much that their that their reason discourse is ban and ignore anything that they don't really feel comfortable answering. Well, guess what? This is the same tactics used by the Brady bunch, by the Moms Demand Action bunch by the mayor's uh, the mayor's group and the any town group or every town or whatever they call themselves. These are the same taxes used by them. And as a result of this, I have to assume they are not pursuing that litigation. And I have to assume that because they even refuse to reply with a no comment or we cannot comment on any possible litigation that we may or may not be involved in. They're just like, eh, ignore him. He'll go away. Which really doesn't work with me. Go figure. But hey, it's time to run the audio that clip that tells you how to contact me. And when we come back from that, we'll hit the news. And I'll have an editorial for you on that as one of our stories. 
And then we'll sign it off. And I think, I, I don't think I'm going to do a, I don't think on this episode I'm going to do a scenario. I may, I may not. We'll consider it when we get to the end of the show. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. Well, for those who want to know, I do occasionally feel the need to do an editorial. And after trying to ignore the Confederate flag debate and deciding it simply won't go away, and people keep asking me about it in emails and other forms of communication, I have finally decided to weigh in on it. This whole debate considers on blaming an object or a symbol for the mental issues or criminal behavior of someone. As a society, we need to accept that we will need to lock up those who will do evil while helping those that have mental issues. And by have mental issues, I mean those that truly have them, not those that claim them in order to avoid punishment. We do not need to ban objects or symbols because someone commits a criminal act and somehow links that object or symbol to the event. If we were to continue this idea of banning a flag because it was somehow associated with evil, then I say we ban the Mexican flag for the atrocities committed at Goliad and the Alamo. Or maybe we ban the Chinese flag for the atrocities committed at Tent. Tiananmen Square. Or maybe we ban all the Nazi merchandise for the uh for all the atrocities committed against Jews and gypsies. Or maybe we ban the the Soviet flag for all the atrocities committed by the Soviets against their own people. As you can see, it would be unreasonable to ban these objects simply because of one thing or another. It is, in my opinion, foolish. It is extremely foolish to ban an object simply because somebody somehow associates it with an act of evil. Now, if it's an instruction manual for committing underage rape and getting away with it, that's a different story. If it's a guide on how to commit a crime and then get away with it, you're getting, in, you're getting into a very gray issue on the First Amendment. But a flag is a First Amendment issue. A flag is nothing. but an object. A gun is nothing but an object. A human is responsible for the hate. A human is responsible for the act. Not a flag, not a gun, not a rock, and not even an idea. Simply put, an idea itself does not go out and commit a crime. An idea may lead someone to considering that crime, but the idea does not commit that crime, nor does an object, nor does a symbol. Now, the link in, for this article in the editorial, that link is going to go to a news article 
on the debate revolving around the Confederate flag. It's just, I'm throwing a link in there so you got something to read. We have one story in politics, and then we have an update after that. Across the state, officials are considering the impact of the new laws passed by the 84th legislature. The article that's linked to this story deals with the Bexar County uh, courthouse and other buildings and facilities, along with unenforceable signs. Essentially, the law points out that the Bexar County signage or the signage that Bexar County has on its courthouse is probably in violation of some of the new laws. As a result, our officials are having to chart a new course of action. Maybe they could follow the law. Maybe they could simply choose not to try and deny people their rights. What a novel concept. For our update, in an earlier episode, we discussed the mayor of Lubbock being investigated by the Texas Rangers due to an obvious conflict of interest Lubbock PD would have if they conducted the investigation themselves. Now we have an update that includes the Texas Rangers have finished their investigation, and as a result, there will be no charges filed as a result of that incident. The link in the article takes you to the full story. It's in it's on the Lubbock Online website, which I believe that's the newspaper, Lubbock Avalanche Journal's website. Well, I'm going to hit the sign-off music, and we're going to wrap this show up. As I said earlier, I don't think we're going to do a scenario for this episode. There's too much firework noise going on, and I can't really... Oh, that one was right on top of the house. I'm trying to edit this out so that you won't hear it. But if I miss a little of it, please forgive me. However, I would like to thank everybody that has advanced gun rights in the state of Texas and the 84th legislature. I would like to thank those that have been involved in calling their legislators and uh, getting them to support legislation. And I want to thank Charles Cotton, as well as our NRA and TSRA representatives, Tara Mitcha and Alice Tripp, for all the hard work they did. With that said, please stay safe and carry responsibly. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly. Now, for those who are listening, just to see if there is anything after the music, well, there's this nothing, or this audio that does nothing, kind of like the Seinfeld show. It's all about nothing.